Okay. Um, welcome you all. We're happy you're here. Uh, Robert, are you our moderator? Are you going to jump in? I, I am the moderator. Okay. <laughs> you jump right in. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here for the Tilt Workshop, where we're going to be learning about how to uh, make our assignments transparent. Uh, say, by and large, since I joined the Teaching Center, this is one of the most effective and immediately effective uh, techniques that I've learned. Uh, so I hope that you feel the same way. Uh, my name is Robert Ladd. If you haven't met me already, I'm the moderator for this session. And this session is designed for faculty, but obviously everyone's allowed to attend. Um, we do have some rules. I think most people here have already been in a session with me anyway. Uh, uh, but just to reiterate them, we want to make sure that our first and last names are showing uh, so that we can record attendance. We only want to gauge in the chat when directed to do so by the presenter and or at least it should be on topic. Um, so no side conversations, as it were. Uh, raise your hand if the presenter asks for questions. That way we can uh, we don't miss you and we can make sure that we're addressing whatever it is uh, that you have questions about. And only unmute yourself uh, when directed so that we don't have a lot of feedback. Uh, we appreciate your dedication to learning and your commitment to following these guidelines throughout the presentation. Uh, this session is being recorded. If for any reason you want us to not record it or you want to ask a question that you don't want to be on the recording, just send me a message and let me know and I'll do that. Um, so this. Uh, Presentation is being presented by Nilly Ann Shoecraft. I'm not sure if she needs an introduction either, uh, but she works uh, with us at the Teaching Center, was formerly the director of the Teaching Center, and is a communications professor. Um, Nilly Ann, take it away. All right. And Miss Amy is my partner in crime today. So we will be talking about Tilt. Uh, this workshop is an introduction to Tilt. So brand new, assuming you don't have content knowledge at all. So some of you may already have a little bit of background and you're just showing up for a refresher. That's great, too. But just to let you know what to expect, we are going to explain what it is, uh, how to create a tilted assignment. Amy's going to share some research with you. We're, then we're going to talk about how we're using it at Nashville State. And as Robert said, uh, it's one of the easiest things that he's learned as far as e immediate implementation. And I have to say, that's why tilt is my favorite thing that I've learned in all my years of teaching, because this is not some huge overhaul. This is not a redo of your course. This is nothing to panic about. TILT stands for Transparency and Learning and Teaching. And basically, it's a model for how we can write assignments that are transparent for our students. And transparent basically means we help them understand why they're learning the information and what they can do with the information. And so we're going to talk about that today. When we talk about transparency, again, many of us that teach, um, well, actually, I'll just say I, uh, I would love to think that my students are just motivated, right? They've registered, they've signed up, they want to learn. Uh, but after 26 years of teaching, I find that that's not always true. <laughs> Some are there because their parents told them to. Some are there because they don't know what else to do. Some are there because it's free. And that's OK, too. Uh, if we had 100 percent of our students completely motivated to learn our content, uh, then obviously our jobs would be easier. But a lot of us teach gen ed classes and students are there because they have to be right. They have to check the box on their little list of gen ed classes that they have to take. And I find with that, because I teach primarily gen ed, that they need to be motivated. They need to know why they're learning what they're learning. And so when we talk about being transparent, we're going to talk about how they're learning the content and how they are going to use it in their lives after college. In other words, why it's relevant. And there are three parts to TILT that we're going to talk about today. And um, part of that is also, oops, back and we're going to talk about the purpose today is why are these assignments helpful? Why do they provide more equitable opportunities for college students? Uh, you should be able to create a tilt assignment or at least really get started creating a tilt assignment, knowing what those elements are. Uh, we definitely want you to know the value of it or believe in the value of it, because if you don't believe in the value of it, you're probably not likely to actually use it or do it. 
Uh, and then task and criteria are the other two parts of TILT. And for today, our purposes of task and criteria will be, we're gonna review the characteristics, we're gonna share the research and discuss implementation. And then criteria, you leave with an understanding of the TILT framework. So when we talk about the TILT framework, all it means is that in your assignment that you create, you're gonna have three parts. You're gonna have the purpose, which will include the knowledge and skills, you're gonna have the task, and then you're going to have the criteria. And we're gonna talk about all three of those. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, I'm a teacher, I already do this. What is she talking about? Uh, and some of you, you might have 70% of this already in your assignment. You may have a really solid assignment and you realize you only need to update 30% to meet these requirements. Others of you may realize, wow, there's quite a bit of updating to do. What we encourage you to do when you're starting out with TILT is get in your mind one assignment that you would like to start with. And for us in the communication program, uh, we started doing this three years ago, which is crazy. It's been that long ago. <laughs> but we started with our most common or most used speech assignment. And then we worked together to create and revise that assignment. And again, some of the information was already there, but some of it we needed to update. So we're going to start first with the first part is the purpose. And this is basically you creating an appreciation of the value of the assignment. And when I started out, I talked about we would love to think our students are 100% motivated, but they're not all and we're not all. Um, when we talk about creating the value, I want to ask you all, if you're going to a meeting or a training session or something that you're supposed to attend, how many of you want to know what you're getting out of it or how it's going to benefit you? I mean, do any of us love to show up and think, hmm, have no idea what the purpose of this is, but I'm having a great time. This is awesome. Uh, no, it's humans. It's not just our students. It's us. I know sometime in the next week, I am going to show up for something. And in my mind, I'm going to think, why am I here? Like, what is the point of me being here? We want to know that. How is it valuable? Why is it relevant? And again, back to, especially if you're teaching gen ed, we've got students put in a classroom because they're required to be there. They don't know the why, other than it's on a list of what they're supposed to take. So as a teacher, when I'm creating assignments, I want to think about why. Why is this necessary? What are they going to do with it? And when we think about the skills and knowledge, it's kind of the two parts of the purpose. What are the long-term, what's the relevance long-term to students' lives? What, how is it applicable? What are they going to do with it? And specifically the knowledge, how is it connected to these learning outcomes in this course? Because it's not, they don't take COM 2025 just because it's on a list. We know as the teachers, they take it because th they need the information for the rest of their life, for their relationships, for public speaking, for their work skills. We know they need it. But if we don't create the why when we're creating assignments, it's now that I know about TILT, it seems so obvious. Well, how, why would I expect them to be motivated to do this? So really, it's the purpose of why is it relevant? What are they going to do with it? How are they going to use the knowledge in their life? Now. A lot of this, you know, when I worked with Amy and we redid our speech assignment or revised, I guess, we were saying a lot of it in class when we were discussing the assignment, but a lot of it didn't get put in writing necessarily of what's the purpose. What's and the reason it's so important that it's also written in the assignment, it's in that is that, first of all, not everybody retains it all, right? Second of all, we have people that miss class. And another reason is just they need to refer back, right? We know that we need repetition in our daily lives to understand and retain material. So by having it in the actual assignment, they can refer back to that. So we start with the purpose. To me, it's super helpful as the faculty member to be asking myself these questions. What knowledge, skills, and abilities do they really need to get out of this assignment? When we first started discussing TILT in our communication program, there were times we realized, oh, there's some stuff in here they probably don't need to do. Uh, there was other stuff that we realized, wow, we really need to list and explain this out in the purpose. 
I say it's an ongoing process. I don't <clears throat> consider this a check mark. You finished it because I feel like every semester you learn, you grow, you think of other things you could add, delete. Uh, so I'll think of this as an ongoing process. I think that also helps because we realize it doesn't have to be perfect. Perfect. So once we have the purpose, we want to think about the task. This is the what. What will students do? What will they do? How will they do it? When will they do it? How long does it need to be? What are the steps to follow? Due dates, things to yeah. avoid. Uh, this is where some people share common what not to do's uh, if, the, if it's a common pitfall for students. This is the area that most faculty have pretty decent idea in their task. But again, how can we make it more clear? Can we put it in steps? Can we put it in chronological order? Can we even divide it up? If it's a big project, can we divide it up weekly? Can we divide it up early semester, late semester? Think about what is it you want them to do? You know, in our calm speech that we have them do, they do an outline but just by listing, you need to do your outlines. Well, we've listed a task, but could we be much more clear about what that is? Yes, you'll create a preparation outline that is this long and that meets these requirements. Then you'll create a delivery outline that has these guidelines, these requirements, so that it, the idea is that if a student is sitting at home and they have the assignment, even if you're not there, right? And it's not an online class or you're not in Zoom with them, they can look at that assignment and they know what the task is. The other thing I love about being very clear in the task is that we have found by using it, it cuts down on so many questions because it's right there. Again, a lot of times we were saying it in class, we were discussing it in class, but if it's in the actual document, they have that with them 24 hours a day. So for those students that want to work on it at one o'clock in the morning and you're not available, it's very clear what the task is. And just like our student, we want if we're expected to do a project for our boss. Don't we want to know what we're supposed to do, how to do it, when to do it, when it's due, how important it is, um, which leads us to when I say how important the criteria for our students, is this a 10 point assignment? Is this 100 points? Is it major in the course? Is it minor? How are they going to be assessed? Is it subjective? Is it objective? Is it a, you know, quiz? Like, how will they be assessed? Now, most of us have a checklist or a rubric or something, but being crystal clear about how they will be measured. What does success look like? in the class. We can give examples to help with that. We can discuss it in class. We can share past students' work if um, we have permission of the past student. But for us in our speech class, when we went to a specific detailed evaluation rubric, and again, we had one. It's not like we didn't have one, but we much more in-depth point deductions for each part not just the introduction, you know, actually divide it up. Visual aids are eight points, right? Citing your sources is seven points. Then again, this is for a hundred point assignment. It's for a major assignment, but you all, I don't get, I'm going to knock on wood, but I don't get hardly any great appeals, pushback. Why did I get a B? Why did I? Because it's all right there. And to me, the most important part of the criteria is that they get it the same time they get the task and the assignment. They know from the very beginning, this is the purpose. This is why I'm doing it. This is why it's relevant. Here's the task. This is what I'm going to do, when I need to do it, how I need to do it, and the criteria. This is how I will be assessed. The idea is that they get all of that together because, again, it's going to they're going to be much more likely to be successful. And at least I can say, how can I say that? Well, Amy's going to share some research with you, but also from my individual classes. And again, we're in the year three of tilting. It has helped our students immensely. They have a public speaking is something they're very anxious about. Uh, they don't feel like they know how to do it. They're scared. It's they've never done it before. This has made it so much more clear of why they need to do it, how they do it and how they will be assessed. So before I pass it over to Amy to talk about the research and hopefully motivate you to use it, 
what questions do you have about the actual process? And again, it's purpose, task, criteria. Maria has her hand raised. Go right ahead, Maria. Okay, here's my question. How about you're talking about rubrics to self-evaluate or evaluate it and give them a, how does it affect their grade system? Does the assignment has to be a graded as, uh, assignment? I mean, how about if I use it just as a kind of like a group in a group setting for them to learn the concept I am teaching to practice it in class? Great question, because again, we use tilt on a minor to a major scale. You all, the criteria can be like my class activities, they're participation based. They know from day one, the criteria, if you are there, you're participating, you're getting the points. That is the criteria, right? So it can be participation based, it can be, um, you know, activity and class points, but just the explanation. So like Maria, your question's perfect because if it is just something they're working in a group and they're going to get points for doing that, if they don't know that criteria, they might be worried, right? How much is this worth? Do we have to get the answers right? What if our group is wrong? Are we still going to get the points? So thinking through things that we might assume they know, your criteria might just be if you're working and you're trying in your group, then you're getting the participation points. And that makes it clear for them. And that's ideally what we want to do. Absolutely. And going right. a step further from that, it could even be the criteria is you're engaged in working on this project with your classmates, period. We don't mm -hmm. usually want to tell our students, you're not getting points for that, right? Mm -hmm. You're not getting points for participating, but the criteria is, right? So just say the criteria is for this part of the project is that you're working together and engaging with each other, full stop. Don't have to tell them how many points or that there's no points, but the expectation isn't you get 10 problems correct. The expectation is you're working together to try to find a solution to these 10 problems to report back out when we come back together as a class or two problems or one problem as the case may be. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Amy, but again, review. A tilted assignment just means you define the purpose, which will include the knowledge and skills that you expect students to learn and gain. Then you're going to define the task, and then you're going to make sure the criteria is clear. And Yasmin, go ahead. Okay, um, I, um, I use the same um, guide, bullet points, the points here. Uh, in, in my lecture class, I think that's kind of helps the students to be more focused. Um, therefore, uh, the, this um, um, tilt assignment is not necessarily for only showing the assignment. We, I think we can modify it, make it hybrid, <laughs> and Absolutely. then put it into the discussion in the classroom as well. When we are saying something verbally like, hey, this is the objective, this is the purpose, this is how you will do it. Absolutely. So I think um, it is, um, for me, it is useful to articulate what I'm going to say and make it a very direct point to the students. And therefore, I like it and I use it and, and I'm going to use it too. Great. Yes. I love that, Yasmin. And I want to follow up on one thing you said that can be super helpful with TILT. A lot of times when we're in a virtual class or we're in a face-to-face -face ground class, we're like, I'm saying it, I'm saying it, I'm saying it. If there's a grade attached to it, have a backup. It can be a page in your module. It can be the assignment that you're giving. But many times we say it and we're like, I said it, they got it. And we know from experience that just because we say it, they may not catch it. And Tilt really helps us take what we say to help be part of the assignment that's there so that students have that transparency that we strive for every day. So we're gonna take a little step back from what TILT is to be able to talk about why we want to TILT. And this goes back to the transparency and learning and teaching TILT in higher ed project. And as we look at this project, it's important to note that this project's driving question 
was what is the smallest teaching intervention that would increase student success? So it's not looking at an overhaul, but what is the smallest thing that we can ask faculty to do that has an impact on student success? And so this is a research-based approach that's equity focused. And again, I want you to hear smallest teaching intervention. Now, as we look at these small teaching interventions, what we're able to find is that as the research was published from the University of Las Vegas and Nevada, they published it in the Chronicle of Higher Education and then the AAS and CNU's peer review. And the focus was, let's have teachers, faculty, these 35 faculty who were part of the project do two small teaching interventions. We want them to take something that they're already doing and tilt two things. In the classes that were studied when this was first done, there were 1,800 students. 425 of them were first-generation students. 402 were non-white. 479 were low-income students, and there were 297 multiracial students. So these 35 faculty went into their classes. They tilted two things, and the results were stunning. The results showed that an impact happened not just on student learning, but when we look at these students, they had an increase in academic confidence. So I'm feeling more confident as a student in this teacher's class than I was before. And I'm more confident about subsequent classes that I'm gonna have with other teachers. Students also noted that they had a strong sense of belonging in the classroom, which extended to the entire college. And so they didn't just feel like they had learned, but they felt like they had a community that they belonged to at the university. They also were able to describe the skills that they were going to use in the workplace that were employer valued skills. And so it's not just, I've learned course objectives, I've taken tests, I've done assignments, I've got this, but they were able to talk about how those course objectives relate to the real world and connect them to the things or to the world around them. So our next couple of slides are going to look at the impact of the study. And so there were substantively important effects on first-generation students. So if we look at the slide that's in front of us, the low transparency courses, those that weren't part of TILT, are in blue. The transparent courses are in the kind of camo green color right underneath that. And if you notice, in every area that's measured, amount of transparency, I understand what I'm doing on the assignments, employer valued skills, academic confidence, and sense of belonging. The transparency first generation students responses are much higher, substantively higher than those who were in non-transparent courses. So I want us to pause on this screen for just a minute. If I'm a first generation college student at the end of the term, if I feel like I have a better understanding of the content, I know the skills that I've learned, I'm confident and I have a sense of belonging. What is likely to happen for those students? What do you think is going to occur? Are they going to enroll again to take other courses? This can be yes, this can be no. You can do your little yes. fingers. Okay, I'm getting a yes, thank you. So we think they're gonna come back, right? So if we look again and go a little bit deeper, we're going to look at our students and be able to see that these students didn't just come back the next semester, but those who received transparent instruction, one class of transparent instruction, had 13 to 15% higher retention rates for two years. Well, it makes it easier when, when you understand why you're doing something and you understand what the goal is, you're going to keep trying until you succeed. 
Especially when you're, that, if that goal is connecting to your future job, right? right? And if your confidence is up, then you're going to be more successful. If I believe I can do it, if I trip, I'm probably going to keep going. If I have this moment of, oh no, what am I doing? How does this look? Am I doing something wrong? When it's transparent, I can go back and check and get a better understanding of what's there. What what's I love about saying? Tilt, oh Beth, I'm sorry, go ahead. What's that old saying about if you say you can or if you say you can't, you're, you're correct? And as instructors, we can tell students they can, but if they don't believe it, it's hard. But if we give them a tilted assignment, we can say, let's look at task step one. What does that look like? What does task step two look like? I know from looking in this room, we have people who teach so many different courses. I can't take do physics, students say. I can't do A and P, students say. I can't public speak. I can't do math. I know you've heard these before, right? With a tilted assignment, we're able to take it and say, great, we can't write now, but can we do task one? Can we work this one problem? Right? And then suddenly we're doing math. And so when we think about how we use tilt in our classes, I want to emphasize again, the study showed the increase in retention rates, the increase in academic confidence, the increase in belonging, the increase in knowing the employer skills that they have developed came from two small teaching interventions. Do not go and re-overhaul your entire course. Two. Now you may decide after doing two, you know, I should do this one also and this one also. That's great. But the study showed two small teaching interventions had these positive effects on our students. I will caution you as you start to write these assignments, how we use these tilted assignments in our classes. Sometimes as academics, when we start writing, we start writing for our colleagues. And we start writing to make these tilted assignments sound really, really good. Hit pause a second and write for your students. Use language that your students understand. And sometimes that means you may tilt for this fall first seven week course and then decide, you know what? Second seven week needs a little bit of difference there because the wording threw them off. When we use tilt in our classes, it can be for a major assignment. It can be for something minor. But I also want to emphasize that tilt can benefit faculty also. Because if the assignment that we've tilted is clear for our students, it's going to make it easier on us. It helps guide conversations. It helps focus our students. My favorite thing that students do is they come and they say, I don't understand the whole assignment. And I'm like, great. Which part? All of it. Well, with a tilted assignment, you can say, okay, are we confused about the purpose? Are we confused about a part of the task? Are you confused about the criteria? My favorite often that students say is they're like, you know, I can't do task eight. And I'm like, great, did you do one through seven first? No. Well, let's do one and then two and then three, right? Show them the steps because you're right. You can't do step seven if we haven't done the six steps ahead of that. And it helps make it clear and focused in the conversations that we have, the emails that we send, the discussions that we're a part of, whether virtual, online, or face-to-face, -to, -face, to help direct students towards the goal. It's transparent for our students, but it's also transparent for us. And that is such a wonderful win. So I want to shift a little bit now that we know what TILT is. We see that TILT benefits our students and can benefit us. And I wanna talk a little bit about how we're tilting at National State. So when we talk about TILT, I know Robert this morning in his OER session was talking about how TILT helped really greatly with his work there. TILT has been part of our Achieving the Dream Plan here at National State. It's one of our equity-focused initiatives. 
because what's really important to note about TILT, it helps first generation students. It helps our underrepresented students. It helps low socioeconomic students. But the TILT research showed that it helps all students. Please hear me there, all students. And those where the equity gaps are the highest are helped more. And so first generation students were helped more than white male students, but white male students still were helped. So if we can help all students by tilting, everyone raises with their abilities and we're able to start closing those equity gaps. And we focused on those with Charles Clark on Wednesday in convocation and with Dr. Jackson's goals for our biennial priorities. And so TILT is a way that we as faculty can focus on those equity goals. NSCC 1010, all NSCC 1010 assignments are tilted. So students who are first time, full time, full time freshmen come in, they take NSCC 1010 and they get used to seeing the tilted framework. It's been implemented in individual courses. Some divisions and schools and departments are using the, uh, these for their IE goals to talk about the impact of tilt. Some are using them for their GEA, general education assessment goals, to show how tilting an assignment is having an impact on their student success rates. As we look at this a little bit more in depth and move forward, it's important to note that it's not just a little part. A happy news for me and hopefully for you, for those who have been here multiple years, the Teaching Center has a Nashville State Community College tilt survey. And for the last two years, we've been running that tilt survey and I've had to, we've sent a link out from the Teaching Center and you get it near the end of the semester and you have to embed it and it causes a little bit of stress. In front of you right now is the permanent link for the NSCC tilt survey. So if you have a seven week course, if you have a five week course, if you have a 15 week course, if you are a course lead, you can take this link, put it into your course shell and it's not gonna change. You don't have to update it. It does mean that we have to ask students for one thing that we weren't asking them for before. We ask them for the term and year that they're taking the course. But this hopefully takes a layer of work off of you as faculty so that if you know I've tilted two assignments this week, next week, while we're working on prepping our D2L course shells that just came available, you can go ahead and embed this. You can make it as part of your last week's work. You can embed it in your new section in advance and know that it's there so that we can get data from your classes about the impact of tilt. That data will be shared back with you, but it allows us to see it from a college perspective. And if there's enough participation from individual course perspectives and even division and department perspectives. So I wanted to share that good news with you about having a permanent link as we move forward, which I hope helps. Know that you're not alone. When you're tilting, sometimes you get stuck in your head. You can always email the teaching center and set up an appointment with us or email us and say, hey, here's my tilted assignment. Do you mind reviewing it? Please don't say in the next five minutes because that's probably not going to happen. But we'll review it and get back to you and let you know because we're not subject matter experts in your area. And we approach it as students do. Before we started, some of us were talking about having children. You can hand it to your kids, your teenagers, your preteens and say, read through this. What questions do you have? and then be able to go back to it and start making edits to help it be more transparent. When you tilt in a course, we also ask you to complete the Teaching Center CRTP tilt form. If you are tilting in a course this semester or in past semesters, let us know how it's gone. Once you've done it in three courses, that can be three different courses, the three same course sections. It does not matter as long as it's implemented in three courses of any shape size that you teach. You can fill out this form and it's one of the requirements for the CRTP certificate through the Teaching Center. And CRTP stands for Culturally Responsive Teaching Practices. And TILT 
as a culturally responsive teaching practice that helps us close those equity gaps. Our hope is that you're thinking, yeah, I want to tilt. On Wednesday, next Wednesday at 10 a.m., Neely Ann and I are going to lead a tilt interactive assignment workshop. This is where you can bring your rough drafts. You can even bring your final drafts if you think it's final. And we're going to work in groups and we're going to analyze them and allow you to team up with people who aren't your subject matter people so they can read through it and ask questions to help make the tilt assignment better. And so if you're working on something or have something that you've used in past semesters, please feel free, sign up. Registration is required because we're limiting it to ensure that we have time to look at each person's requirement, each person's assignment and give them good feedback during that session. But we wanted to make sure you were aware that that's available. Another wonderful thing that's available for you is the Tilt Higher Ed website. On the Tilt Higher Ed website, you'll notice that there's that lovely last box over at the right that says Tilt Examples and Resources. At Tilt Higher Ed, you can go there and they have before and after work that you have to be able to show an assignment from statistics or from business or from so many other sources that say, here was a pre-tilt assignment. Here's a post-tilt assignment. So you can see the before and after. And by seeing the before and after, you're able to get ideas to borrow, to be able to see different things that we have done, that others have done, that may be helpful for you. So we're going to pause again at this point, and we want to engage in some questions. Those can be, how can we use TILT? What are questions you have about TILT? Bring all of your questions to us. We're ready to help you. Howard, talk to us. I'm, I'm using it, and I think it's just a better way of, of explaining everything uh, where they can, especially newer students, can, can find things. So I found it very helpful. I love that feedback, and I'm going to say something that Howard, you usually say. Howard is having to teach all online. All of his students are online. And we know that means that students are working every hour of the day coming in and doing something. And when it's clearer for them, it's easier for them to be able to do the work. And you get less stressed out emails of where is this? What are you wanting? Because it's clear and it's there for students already. Yasmin, talk to us. I started using it only for two things. One was presentation and one was one simple quiz. And then when I developed organic chemistry one class, um, uh, this class went also in hybrid form. So one section is hybrid, one section is online. What I did uh, and also I learned and I'm going to use is this tilt uh, concept into all the lab writing and that makes things way easier i'm not sure if everybody aware of in organic chemistry we are very old school we keep note handwritten note um a notebook throughout the semester and a student keep it as they are, they go with the class so uh, with this format helps me not to answer so many emails <laughs> as well as which is very nice the, after the pandemic um, because you all get a lot of emails these days um, and then um, also it also helps students to self-evaluate because they know that if they are not writing the reaction mechanism they're going to lose points and obviously I must I may believe it of second chance so I, it's kind of helped me to grade as well so instead of um, I'm spending so many hours, which I used to do before the tilt. Now I just look into the things if they are there. And then that helps me to grade. And that also helps the student to self-evaluate. So it's kind of win-win for me and for my students. I think you would, everybody will agree with that. Mm -hmm. I love the win-win approach of both sides. I will say when we started tilting, I did two because, you know, it says do two. So I did two. and I. 
tilted in a class and it made me giggle halfway through the semester because I had tilted an assignment. Then I had a similar assignment that wasn't tilted and then a similar assignment that was tilted. There's my two, right? And I came in for the fourth assignment that wasn't tilted and a student in the back raised their hand. And they said, hey, Miss B, can we have the long version of this one? And I was like, what? And they said, well, you know, some of them are longer and more detailed, and we really like that. Can you give us the long version? And I busted out laughing because they didn't know TILT. They don't need to know that acronym, but they recognized the difference. And they wanted the tilted version for the clarity. And I said, yes, absolutely. I don't have that one on me, which meant I haven't created it yet. And I went, made it, and then sent them the long version because that's what they wanted. And for me, that was a really great light bulb moment of this is working. Even if they don't recognize what it is, they've already seen a difference. Yes, man, talk to us. I, I think after hearing you, I felt like, I don't wanna use a bad word for me. I, I felt horrible about myself, like before explaining, just verbally explaining, not giving them any, written or clear direction versus what I'm doing now. And I also believe that what I'm doing now is improvement slowly as well. So it's kind of like a, what I have done before is too bad. <laughs> now it's okay. <laughs> you know, this kind of sense works at, uh, for, for me. And it's all, we're all learning all the time, right? I am going to stop our recording at this point. Thank you so much for being with us today.